Okay. So uh, today I'm talking with Andrew Joe. He's a PhD candidate in uh, the Northwestern University Interdepartmental Neuroscience Program. Uh, welcome to Conversations on Science, Andrew. Thanks for having me, Idris. No, uh, it's it's been a long time coming. I've been trying to get you to do this, but <laughs> yeah, I know yeah, you're you're a very uh, hard guy to pin down, right? <laughs> well, let's say I'm a very busy guy, so <laughs> that's I can uh, attest to that. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, common practice for me to ask my guests to give um, a description of their journey through science and uh, how they find themselves in the school or lab. They currently are today so uh, if you can just give us a description of your journey through you know the sciences and you can start from your undergrad if you want okay so actually my journey in science started before undergraduate so I started doing bench work science as a high school student I think at the beginning of my freshman year I had an awesome biology teacher named dr. Talbot and he actually, with his help actually, I got a position to volunteer for a laboratory at the University of Utah. And so during the summers, I would volunteer myself to work for that laboratory. So um, what they did is they are trying to understand these cone snails or these venoms from cone snails. And the hope is to crystallize these proteins and at least sequence them so we could use them for therapeutic um, applications. So non-opioid based, um, you know, pain treatment. And that was sort of my introduction to science because back then, you know, I had really two options during the summer. Option was to, you know, sit at home and study for the SATs and, you know, work at the 7-Eleven with my parents. And I didn't really like, you know, working at 7-Eleven. <laughs> and, I can and imagine. So parents, yeah. So my parents said, like, either you do something productive or you're coming to the store. And I thought, you know, you know, working for a laboratory sounds like a hell of a much more fun than, you know, working at the store. Oh, yeah. Parents. That sounds so, like an easy choice for you back then. Yeah, it was a very easy choice. So that's how I spent my summers. It was essentially, um, you know, doing bench work and studying the ACTs, SATs on the side. So. and. When I, uh, you know, began my undergraduate year, I decided to move to a different laboratory, and I settled upon Dr. David Krejci's laboratory at the University of Utah at the Moranai Center. And what they do is they try to study trip channels in the retina. So trip channels, so transient receptor potential channels, are these. It's a very, you know, huge family of different ion channels. So, for example when you eat something like a chili pepper, like the active ingredient is called capsaicin. It's the one that activates the trip channels, causing you to feel pain. And there are many of them. Like for example, some of them are activated by menthol. So you can feel cold. Others are activated by things like temperature, uh, stretching, and a whole different types of stimuli. And curiously, these channels are present all over your brain and in your retina. And my work with Dr. David Krejci was to understand how a particular channel called trib 4 was responsible for allowing ganglion cells or retinal cells to detect stretch or mechanosensitivity. And the implications of was that it has a huge role in glaucoma because glaucoma is characterized as there's an increase in pressure in the eye and somehow that pressure is killing cells and this leads to blindness. And for a very long time, people really didn't understand how pressure kills retinal neurons. And what we discovered is that a lot of the cells that are vulnerable to glaucoma in the retina actually have these mechanosensors, like these trip channels that allow them to sense the pressure, but you know, too much pressure causes these um, channels to overactivate and this causes cells to die and this causes you to lose vision and so that was sort of my undergraduate work and then when i moved to graduate school i continued to stay in the retina and instead of looking at things like glaucoma and trip channels i'm trying to understand circuitry so how information or light information 
in the retina is processed before going to the brain. Very interesting. Wow. So full disclosure, you did talk about your grad uh, lab and um, we're actually in the same lab, right? So, so we share yes. a lab at Feinberg yes. School of Medicine under Professor mm -hmm. Youngling Zhu. Mm -hmm. That's so, correct. Yeah. Can you talk more about your work uh, with uh, Professor Youngling? So Professor Youngling Zhu is, so she's interested in you know, inner retinal circuits. So the retina is a very complicated system. You know, many people think that the retina is like, a, you know, it's like analogous to a, a camera, correct? But it turns out that our retina is much more complicated than that because not only it captures images, but it starts to process that information into like thousands of different parallel pathways. And those thousands of different parallel pathways, um, you know, transmit a lot of different type of information to the brain. Okay, I hate, so, to, I hate to stop you there, but it's mm -hmm. something we're actually going to touch on uh, right. further down. So before we actually talk about the retina, right? Um, right. Let's actually create a, a visual diagram of the eye itself, right? Right. So this okay. tool we use to perceive our world. Right. So a few years ago, right, an Australian zoologist uh, named Andrew Parker, you actually share the same first name with this guy. So mm -hmm. he uh, claimed convincingly that... Um, the Cambrian explosion, right, that uh, happened, I think, some 400, 540 million years ago was due to organisms uh, starting to, you know, possess a pinhole-like uh, apparatus that enabled them to basically, you know, evade predation and it enabled others to, I guess, um, hone their uh, predatory abilities, right? So uh, this in turn led to mass um, speciation, right? So in a matter of some like 10 million years, we had this explosion of species, right? Which is more or less a drop in a bucket in a evolutionary time span, right? So 10 million years. So uh, this, according to bio evolutionary biologists, uh, was more or less a big bang of biology, right? Mm -hmm. So the value of our eyes cannot really be over, you know, stated, especially for human beings, right? Uh, whereby I think some 50% of our um, mental processing is actually, you know, used up by visual processing, right? I mean, so, we are visual creatures. I mean, yeah. you know, of all, you know, I'm not here to, you know, despair like other uh, sensations like proprioception, thermal sensation, mechanical sure. sensation, but, you know, vision, you know, we, as, as a species, we are highly dependent on vision compared to a lot of other different species. That's right. And, you know, like you said, a lot of our, you know, huge chunks of our brain is dedicated to processing vision, mm. you know, and it is very, you know, it is very true that, you know, like I said, you know, if you talk to a lot of people, you know, other than death, a lot of people, you know, fear blindness and, you know, exactly. blindness above all, like scares, you know, people more than say losing the sense of, you know, taste or sense of touch or smell, you know, so we are very, you know, vision centric people. So, so is there a good argument to be made that our evolutionary edge against uh, or over other animals basically stem from, from our ability to make visual sense of our world more than maybe they can? Um, not necessarily. I mean, mm. there are many, you know, what you have to understand about, you know, evolution in nature is that there are a lot of different pathways for, you know, for survivability there's a lot of strategies to survive in your environment and you know in some cases vision is not necessarily you know the best thing to put a lot of energy into you know some environments have a lot of you know sediment or it's not exactly like say murky water so you know you want to have the ability to you know evolve ways to detect prey or evade prey you know if your environment is not exactly best suited for vision so but for us you know where in our environment, you know, vision is suited for us because it does give us, you know, an advantage. So it really depends on, you know, context and the environment. But like I said, you know, there are a lot of, there are multiple ways to, you know, successfully, you know, exist as That's a, right. you know, in terms of biology. All right. So Andrew, can you give us a anatomic description of the eye before we get into the anatomy of uh, the retina. So the eye itself, what are the components of what makes, you know, this 
thing in our skull. So, you know, the, as you probably guessed, the eye is, you know, the circular little object that, you know, stuck in your skull. And the first things first you have is your cornea. And so light passes through the cornea. And then from there, you know, it hits the lens. And so the lens is this like clear, you know, clear, um, almost very elastic um, tissue that exists in, in your eye. And so for us, like the lens actually takes up the majority of the space within our eyes. For our spe other species, um, it might differ a little bit. And so, and at the very back of your eye is the retina. So it's this, uh, you know, this cup looking um, piece of tissue. And what happens is, you know, when the light goes through your cornea, the lens, you know, depending on the shape, whether it's concave or convex, will try to focus that light mostly on an area, what we call the fovea, on the retina. So the retina structure itself has several different layers, actually. So at the very back of your retina are the photoreceptors. And from there, there are horizontal cells, American cells, bipolar cells. And at the very, you know, say, top of the retina, you know, anatomically speaking, is the ganglion cells. But paradoxically, uh, phototransduction actually takes place at the back of the retina first rather than the front of the retina. So in a way, you know, where we actually capture and start processing light information begins at the back of the retina and it moves its way towards the retinal ganglion cells. And from there, you know, the retinal ganglion cells send projections all the way to the back of the brain. Interesting. Or to other parts of the brain. Okay. So, um, yeah, actually, let's talk more about how visual perception actually does work, right? So do we actually see color? Is it an illusion? And how are images formed when it passes through our lens and it focuses in the fovea and how it passes through our optic nerves to what our um, visual cortex and all that? Can we kind of dwell on that a bit more? So I'll give a very superficial explanation. So we do see color because what we have, we have two types of different types of photoreceptors, or those are rods. So rods for the, you know, for a layman is, you know, they sort of detect sort of night versus day, and they're generally more sensitive than say to cones. So cones are the color sensing photoreceptors. There, we come, there are three varieties for humans. So for other animals, they, they might have more or less cones depending on, you know, depending. Like, for example, like the mantis strip actually has nine different types of cones. So it allows them to see uh, different spectrums of wavelength. So for us humans, we generally have three types. So those are like the reds, the blues, and the greens. So we call them, you know, L, M, and S, you know, long wavelength, medium wavelength, short wavelength. So, okay, so, so we have... So is the, the red is the long? Can you? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so red is long. Red is blue. typically the long. Okay. The medium is green. And then the short wavelength is blue. Blue, so, okay. And so you're using a combination of these three different cones to sort of see all the different colors that you see today. And so what happens is that that information is sort of transmitted to the brain. And then from the, there, the brain sort of sort of figures it out, you know, based on, you know, very complex receptive field, you know, information, you know, color, shape, you know, what kind of object is this, et cetera. Okay, sounds good. So where is the image actually focused in, in the eye before it actually goes to our, our brain proper? So for humans and most, you know, higher order or old world primates, um, most of that light is actually focused on a region called the fovea. So it's this little, it's this sort of in the center region of the retina. And that's where you have the densest regions of cones because your periphery retina is actually dominated by rods, actually. And so a lot of that light is focused on the cone rich area called the fovea. And that's where a lot of, you know, that's where a lot of the uh, light information is sort of you know, being to it directly. Okay, so are, so is the human retina more rod um, centric or cone centric? It's you could think of it. It's more if you think in terms of area, it's probably yes. rods, you know, centric. But considering that how most of the light information is sort, how the lens sort of tries to project most of that light onto or the image onto the fovea 
you know, that you could easily say that we are also cone centric in a way as well. Now, other animals such as like mice or cats or I think cats as well don't really have a phobia. In fact, a lot of mammals actually don't really have a true phobia. They might have a sort of fake or pseudophobia or they don't really have a phobia at all and they have sort of cones and rods intermixed in this region. But, you know, for humans, and a lot of, you know, like I said, primates, you know, old world primates like chimpanzees, you know, they have, like I said, a special region, like a phobia where it's densely packed with only like cones. Mm. Interesting. So the fovea, for those who don't know it, is this sort of divot in the back of our eye, right? On the retina. So Yeah, uh, it's like this region of the retina. Yes. So that's sort of like a little bit off center in a way, yeah. if, if I could describe it. Yeah. And do we know why humans and higher primates actually have this uh, this region in their in their retina? That's pretty. It's pretty interesting, though. The fact that it kind of differentiates primates from other animals, if you think about it. So I'm not really sure. You know, the evolutionary, you know, the evolutionary advantage to that. But my guess it would be that we would have you know higher visual acuity comparatively to other organisms so because for example you know a lot of different animals they have different visual requirements and in this case you know having a phobia might have some advantages for survival or object recognition so like i said i can't really place you know exact reason why how a phobia is advantageous for us compared to other you know successful species out there interesting so the basis of your work in a nutshell is really to figure out how what the hundred or so cells in the retina, I guess, circuitry communicate, right? So yes. um, how do we typically shed light on um, transgene expression in the retina? So how do we uh, pinpoint these uh, communication processes, would you say? So in the history of the retina, that's actually been a very difficult thing to do because you know, for many people, you know, ever since the 50s and 60s, when people really started to do, you know, electrophysiology, um, people have been only been able to target cells that sort of are on the, you know, peripherally. So things like photoreceptors or retinal ganglia cells, those were pretty, like, as I would say, you know, low-hanging fruit, you know, easy to record from, easy to figure out sort of what they're generally doing. So my work specifically is trying to target cells in between those cells, what I call emerkine cells. Now, emerkine cells, probably there are about 60 to 70 types that we know of in the mouse retina, and they are sort of generally the largest subpopulation of neurons within the retina. But unfortunately, people really don't understand them that much because, you know, out of the 70 of them, we really only understand about 10 or 13, and we know what they generally do because, you know, the traditional method today to discover new American cells is to use genetic tools. So you would use transgene, you know, techniques like say Cree locks recombinase to insert things like green fluorescent proteins or GCAM and hope that they would express in a very specific type of American cell that no one has ever discovered. But a lot of those genetic strategies are somewhat flawed because they target different types of cells. And so if they are targeting many different types of cells, it's hard to figure out what the, you know, one American cell is doing. So it's really inefficient when you want to figure out, you know, what functional, what they do functionally, you know, what are their biophysical properties, who do they communicate with, and what are their overall goals or function within the retina. And so people have been sort of stuck with this problem for like 10 years or last 10 years, and no one's really able to get around that. So our lab sort of has an answer for that. We are developing intersectional strategy. So it's a very complex genetic uh, strategy so that we can isolate a single type of American cell, not multiple types, just a single type, so that we can figure out what it does. So, you know, what does it respond to? What kind of light information it responds to? Who does it contact to? And how does it shape retinal function overall? Does it you know, provide you know, inhibitory or excitatory signals during a very specific you know, light information? 
And those are so, sort of the questions that we are figuring out right now for one or two or a couple actually novel American cells that no one else has discovered. Interesting. So uh, one of your papers that I read, um, you did touch on this uh, Cree and uh, FLP. Is that how you, do you just pronounce LOXP. it? We call it LOXP. LOXP, so, right. So we call those um, binary, you know, binary strategies because okay. it, a lot of these, you know, Cree LOXP systems or flip and fit systems. So okay. those are two different binary genetic strategies, but they work in a very similar way in which you know, the goal, again, the same goal is to insert some sort of, you know, fluorescent protein or something like that All right. into the cell. So this is basically uh, recombinase technology, right? So, yes. So these are epigenetic tools uh, that helps us cleave and insert, I guess, uh, nucleotides. And nucleotides would be the basic building blocks of uh, genetic material, right? So the Base, the base values of our DNA and RNA, so the RACTG uh, letters, right? In a nutshell, yeah. So a lot of times what happens, so the most, one of the common ways is that you would create a mouse line that, let's say, I would say have some sort of GFP sequence connected to a, a gene that's already present in that particular cell, right? Let's say, oh, uh, Okay, you know, gene X, Y, Z, okay? And those are usually flanked by these lock P sites. And so that mouse is bred with a Cree mice, and that Cree mice would um, uh, transduce a Cree enzyme. And that Cree enzyme will actually attack those lock P sites, and those lock P sites will usually get rid of some sort of stop signal or some sort of, you know, other um, genetic sequence that would allow you know, the GFP signal to be processed. And so that's sort of a very basic explanation of how we can get these mice to express, you know, transgenes. Interesting. All right. So uh, retinal uh, neurons basically comprise of what, I think, three major classes, right? So we've got the primary uh, sensory cells that include um, photoreceptors. That'll be our rods and cones, right? What we uh, described earlier. Then we've got the interneurons, which uh, include our horizontal, bipolar, and uh, amacrine cells, right? Mm -hmm. And then the output neurons, which would be the retinal ganglion cells, so the RGCs, right? Uh, right. Can you tell us uh, about these cells just a bit more and um, the roles each actually play in mm -hmm. the, the facilitating vision? Okay, so there are, like you said, there are the sensory neurons. So there are actually three types now that people argue. So as you said, there are rods and cones. Mm -hmm. But there's a third one that people recently discovered, and those are what we call IPRDCs. So they are named as the intrinsically photosensitive uh, retinal ganglion cells. So these are actually ganglion cells that, are, that have a pigment that oh, the melanopsin detect, RGCs, yeah. right? Yeah, they have a pigment that allows them to detect light, light independent of cones and rods. And so, but getting back to the main point, but for many uh, retinal ganglion cells, the vast majority, they are not, you know, they did not con contain, you know, this um, pigment. Instead, they rely on cones and rods. So, so you have your sensory neurons called cones and rods. And these are ones that detect light, and this is where phototransduction occur. And then the next line of cells that they communicate to are called bipolar cells. And they're called bipolar is because they have two processes, one that go, ver shoots vertically up, and these are the ones that communicate with cones and rods. And then they have another process that you know, shoots way down, which communicates with amacrine cells and ganglion cells. And these bipolar cells are sort of subdivided to do two different classes, on and off. And like what their name suggests, they're telling, you know, American cells and ganglion cells whether there's going to be a light on signal or if there's going to be a light off signal. And so those were those um, by, those are sort of the general functions of bipolar cells. And then you have horizontal cells that communicate with bipolar cells, but they also communicate with cones and rods and so what they do is they sort of provide uh inhibitory feedback to sort of shape the receptive fields 
of ganglion cells down, way down below. But they also have other complex um, functions as well. And then you have emerkine cells. So these are, like I said, they are mostly inhibitory. So they provide inhibitory signals to mostly ganglion cells, but they also provide inhibitory signals to other emerkine cells, to themselves, or to other bipolar cells. And the idea is that they're trying to shape the you know, spatial and temporal properties of retinal ganglion cells. Because at the end of the day, retinal ganglion cells are the output cells. They're telling the brain about, you know, the individual, you know, feature selectivity that they are detecting from the visual line. Because ganglion cells are what we call cells. So they, they're generally thought to detect very specific things from the visual environment, such things like bars that are moving in a particular direction or bars that, like, say, are oriented in a very specific function. Or in some cases, like, you know, objects are mo moving locally compared to the overall background. And there are a lot of, you know, different, you know, feature selectivities that we haven't discovered, but, you know, we're working on. Interesting. Actually, can you touch a bit more on... Um these cells and how they perceive motion? Because some of them would actually notice uh, horizontal lines and some mm -hmm. vertical and uh, some are on or some are off when it comes to light stimulation. So it's, again, it's very complicated because, you know, you think that, you know, for something like moving like this, right, this seems like something easily, very easily encoded, but this is actually, you know, there's a lot of that goes on to encoding, you know, something moving like this in the retina because, you know, you have to have, you know, for an object, you know, you have to have like bipolar cells that they have to detect these things in sequentially, not to mention, you know, there are very specialized emerkin cells and these are what we call starburst emerkin cells. So starburst emerkins are very important because they essentially dictate the ability for these certain ganglion cells to detect moving motion because what they do is that when an object is moving in the preferred direction of a ganglion cell, so, so some ganglion cells only respond if an object is moving like this. If you move like this, they will not respond. So how is this achieved? So what happens is that there is excitatory information that is sent to the ganglion cell when an object is moving this way, but starburst American cells will send inhibitory information if it's moving this way. And so, if the you know, ganglion cell is getting inhibitory information if an object is moving this way, that means that when it and is firing, it will only fire when an object moving is this way. So in reality, it is a very complex you know, nature of how excitatory signals and inhibitory signals from bipolar cells and American cells that are combined in the ganglion cell that allows cells you know, to have a preferred, you know, you know, feature selective, such as like an object mode, you know, moving object moving this way, or object moving this way, or a bar that's moved, angled this way or that way, etc. Interesting. So you did mention the starburst uh, amacrine cells. And if you actually do see them under a microscope, it actually does look like a starburst, right? And, oh, yeah, uh, it's very pretty. It's yeah. a very pretty cell. And these are the ones, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they're the ones that use um, acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter, right? So they use a mixture of both acetylcholine and GABA. So a lot of, it turns out a lot of uh, American cells, like I said, they either use glycine or GABA, but they oftentimes also release like other neurotransmitters or other substances such as, you know, in some cases like the NOS American cell, which releases like nitrite, nitrite oxide, you know, along with GABA or probably GABA. So, like I said, it's very complex. There is, like, subtleties when it, when it comes to American cells. Interesting. So, me personally, if I was uh, to pick a superstar neuron in the retina, I'd say it's the RGCs, right? The retinal ganglion cells. So, that's just my opinion, right? Don't, mm -hmm. don't argue with me on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, I mean, some people would you know, agree with you. Some people won't. You know, yeah. people have their preferences. So, All right. so the reason why I pick them is uh, because they help in... Not only do they help in image processing, uh, they, you know, the ones that don't actually directly facilitate image uh, formation actually act like uh, photoreceptors, right? What we actually spoke about. And uh, some have their ax axons that basically extend to our um, optic nerves, no? And then oh. we've got the melanopsin. I mean, 
Yeah. So yeah, whole ganglion cells, axons, they form, they, all of them form the optic nerve. So okay. whenever you see, like, you know, whenever you look at the diagram eye, so you see that, that little white sort of piece of tissue that's coming to the eye. That's Those right. are all of the axons of the retinal ganglion cells moving, you know, bundled together, moving towards the brain. And then from once they enter the brain, they sort of, you know, they can sort of diverge into different directions. Most of them go to the LGN and then from there to the visual cortex, others directly go to different places like the SEN or super chiasmatic nucleus, et cetera. So then we have what the melanopsin um, RGCs, right? The, mm -hmm. the, what's the other name we call them? IPRGCs. IPRGCs, that's intrinsically photosensitive photosensitive uh, retinal ganglion cells okay so they help with uh, modulating our circadian rhythm right so um, yeah they have a great deal of issue they have a great uh, function in that yes so can you can can you touch on that for us uh, how they actually help with our sleep cycle so um, so in general so I'm not an expert on IPR disease you should probably talk you know interview Tiffany Schmidt if you ever get the opportunity as, okay. um, but so, so what IPR, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what IPRGCs do? So they, they generally what they do is they uh, synapse or they talk to different parts of the brain that deal with circadian rhythm, like the SCN or suprachiasmatic nucleus. And from there, you know, depending on you know the light levels and luminance, they can send you know information about oh, there's light, even though you know we should be sleeping because you know it's dark, right? So that's why, you know, when you're turning on your computer at nighttime, you know, you're activating those IPRDCs and those IPRDCs are communicating to this SEN, oh, it's light time, you know, stay away, you know, don't go to bed, right? Mm. Whereas like it, during the dark, like IPRDC, well, I'm not really detecting any luminance or there might be some very low luminance. So, you know, I'm mostly telling my brain, to, you know, go to sleep, et cetera. Interesting. So, so, so blue light basically disrupts this process, right? Yes, so blue light in particular. Yeah. So yeah, that's the light. science yeah. behind not using your phone at night or right. before you go to sleep because you're messing up your circadian rhythm. And right. I think it has to do with uh, your melatonin, melatonin secretion, right, from, your, um, from the part of your brain that actually secretes it. Yeah, so melatonin and some probably other neurotransmitters are probably involved, but yes, that's correct. All right. Can we talk about um, optogenetics and uh, chemogenetics? Uh, can you explain what those uh, terms mean, Andrew? So optogenetics and chemogenetics are a very fancy tool in neuroscience. In fact, they're not, they're about probably 10 years old, but they're a very powerful tool. So the idea, so optogenetics, sort of have comes in two different flavors, really. So the first one is GCAMP. And so what GCAMP is, is that you put a uh, GFP indicator that tells you, like, you know, calcium fluctuations or calcium levels within that neuron. And it's a very powerful tool to see, like, what kind of activities excite or inhibit a particular neuron, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the other flavor is what we call channelodopsin. So channelodopsin is a light-sensitive protein that conducts sodium, calcium, and some other different cations. And this is actually, this is something discovered in bacteria. I think blue algae, I mean, not, yeah, blue algae, but I, I'm not sure if it was blue algae or some sort of strain of bacteria, but the idea is that you would genetically insert them in a neuron, okay, a population of neurons, and then you would try to record activity from a different population of neurons. And so by exciting one, those neurons with a channel adopted, you can see if those cells are communicating with that other population neuron that you're recording from. And you can tell whether they're providing excitatory signal or inhibitory signal. And then the other flip side is that you can also use this to, you know, see how this affects behavior. So if I were to say, activate you know, let's say a certain population of neurons in your brain and I shine light on it, right? I could see by activating this population of neurons, I could see what kind of activity it would have on, you know, behavior. And so, oh, okay, so this population of neurons, because I excite this, causes 
this behavior. So it's responsible or it's involved in, say, sleeping behavior, eating behavior, whatever. And so that's sort of what we think of in terms of optogenetics. Now, chemogenetic is very similar like optogenetic. And so instead of using light to activate neurons, you can use drugs, drugs that are very specific, you know, very specific for, for a particular type of receptor. And you could use this to activate neurons, but you could also use this to inactivate neurons because there's a lot of power in not only activating neurons, but there's a lot of power also in deactivating neurons to see how shutting down a group of neurons would also affect, say, circuitry or in behavior in general. All right, so this is basically physical techniques versus uh, pharmacological techniques, basically. Yes, I mean, in the end of the day, they're both using genetics because you have to express these channels that are not endogenous to humans or mice or animals. In fact, these are mostly endogenous to probably bacteria or, or other things. But at the end of the day, you know, they have the very same genetic basis, but they use, you know, different types of light versus drugs. Interesting. So now all these uh, terms and techniques sound fancy, right? But for us to be able to actually know about them, we need to cultivate these, uh, you know, genetic materials from wildlife, right? So in our lab, uh, we mostly use mouse models, right? Now we do use other, other models, right? So like ground squirrels and what else? So Youngling, so Youngling mostly uses mouse models, and Steve uses, so Steve DeVries, who is my other mentor, uses ground squirrels. So, so most of these genetic models, like the optogenetics, are done mostly in mice, actually, and not in ground squirrels, because firstly, they're, you know, we, you know, mice has been used for a very long time. First of all, they're cheap as hell. They breed like crazy because, you know, compared to, you know, ground squirrels, ground squirrels have a hard time mating in captivity. And so, you know, raising another generation is very difficult to do. And also, we, we already know their sequence, you know, genomic sequence, and we have a huge mastery over mouse genetics. And so this allows us to do a lot of crazy genetic things with mice. And so the other, you know, model genetic model available is fruit flies because fruit flies we also have like a huge mastery over their genome and their genetics and also allows us to do crazy you know genetic manipulations as well so things like ground squirrels primates and other animals we don't really have a genetic mastery because there are financial and some other sort of hurdles that sort of prevent them from you know being used more widely available Interesting. Now, you did mention hurdles. Now, if you don't mind uh, touching on the rigorous uh, protocol that needs to be adhered to uh, when using these models, um, I just want the listeners to, you know, one, be aware of how it's done, and two, Mm -hmm. really know that uh, we really do follow mostly humane, humanely possible modus operandi when it comes to dealing with wildlife. Now, being in the same lab as you, you're kind of like my lab mentor. You've scolded me a few times when I've been a bit lax when it comes to, you know, disposing and just um, packaging some of these uh, models. But uh, can you kind of touch on our protocol when it actually comes to handling wildlife? So our protocols are very strict, and these are actually usually dictated by IUCOP, and there are like a lot of different agencies, not only within the university, so you have university agencies, but you also have governmental agencies and different fundamental, you know, funding agencies that sort of have a lot of say in how, you know, the treatment of animals, and for the most part, like I said, we try to do things humanely, you know, when we cage them, we try to provide them with, you know, you know, inter- well, we provide them like say what we call analogous to toys and, you know, other comforts that allow them, you know, to live in a very comfortable life. And then when we do need to like use tissue or when we sack them, we do this in the most humane way possible. And so the idea is to minimize pain as much as possible to these mice. And, you know, and if, you know, we are any, if anything, any of these like many rules are sort of neglected or there's like a relapse in like regulations and protocols and people find out the consequences will be very dire. And in a lot of cases, a lot of these consequences include like shutting down laboratory, laboratories, investigations, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is a lot of incentive 
to follow these very humane guidelines in order to, you know, not only for us, but also for the, you know, the treatment and welfare of these animals that we're using as well. Interesting. So there's actually a governing body that sort of uh, monitors these uh, processes. So it's not necessarily Feinberg, the university, but it's actually a general governing body, right? Yeah. So there's like, it's like really like multiple bodies that sort of, you know, are involved in this. So there's like Feinberg has his own sort of committee. You know, there's like a committee at probably at the NIH or NSF that, you know, are probably also, you know, also uh, involved in this. So like I said, it's a very involved, you know, procedure. It's very, you know, there's a lot of regulations. And these regulations, again, are meant for the humane treatment of these animals. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, to segue back to uh, your work, so these days it seems like most of your work is uh, focused on amacrine cells, right? If I'm, if mm-hmm. I'm right. All right. So from what I know, they are synaptically active in the inner plexiform layer, right? So right. first, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the inner plexiform layer? Let's uh, mm-hmm. talk about that. And uh, what's the deal with uh, amacrine cells, by the way? Why do you find them so interesting that you base a good chunk of your work on studying them? Okay, so the inner plexiform layer is, think of it, for people who don't really know, think of it as like where all the wiring for the RDCs take place. Because like I said, RD, most RDCs are not photosensitive. And so they need input from rods and cones, right? But rods and cones don't, never, they never talk to retinal ganglion cells. And so they rely on intermediaries like bipolar cells, right? And so the inner plexiform layer is where those bipolar cells, those amacrine cells, and those ganglion cells sort of, you know, you know, converse. And this is an area where ganglion cells, bipolar cells, and amacrine cells are all communicating with each other. And this is where, you know, feature selectivity, things like orientation selectivity, direction selectivity occurs. You know, a lot of those, you know, computations that the retinal ganglion cells are trying to figure out all occur at the inner plexiform layer. And so, so this leads to my work to amacrine cells is that, like I said, it's not really known what they, what they do in general. Like I said, there are about 60 to 70 types. And, and then what we do know is that they're very important because without these amacrine cells, there's no such thing as direction selectivity, no such thing as orientation selectivity, no such thing as object motion sensitivity. We need inhibitory signals in order to, you know, shape what the computations that are going to arise from the retinal ganglion cells. And so while you like retinal ganglion cells, for me, like, you know, retinal ganglion cells are practically useless without inhibitory signals. And that's why I study American cells, because they hold the key on what the retinal ganglion cells are going to tell to the brain. Otherwise, they're just going to tell, there's not much they can tell specifically and so that's why we study American cells. All right. So you did uh, mention inhibitory neurotransmitters just now. Mm-hmm. So most American cells are inhibitory neurons, right? If I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. especially in uh, uh, the vertebrate neuron. So um, they contain... Well, I mean, a lot of American cells throughout the animal species are inhibitory, inhibitory actually. Okay. So, so if you look at the very basic, you know, retinal structure across, you know, the different species... A lot of they, a lot of them have like some sort of inhibitory feedback signal, and so. But the extent of how complex would that be, it will be depend species to species. But you know, you can imagine that you know, for humans, since we need you know, since we are our eyes are you know designed to com- you know take on more complex features than say light on or off or you know something like some like bright object over there and against a back you know a black background you know for things like object motion or orientation selective, you need, you know, complex inhibitory signaling. Okay. So with amacrine cells, uh, it's uh, mostly the inhibitory neurotransmitter is uh, GABA, right? So that's the gamma amino butyric acid. So there are two of them actually. Thanks. So they are GABA, as you mentioned, but there's some glycine. Okay. So, Glycinergic, right? Right. And so what we find is that most white field amacrine cells, these are like amacrine cells are huge. They have like processes that sometimes stretch the, you know, a huge chunk of the retina. And then you have, you know, amacrine cells that look like small trees, you know, their area is pretty small and those tend to be glycinergic. Okay. So basically we've got the inhibitory and the excitatory, right? So 
What are the differences between both uh, neurotransmitters? So GABA and glycine are what we call inhibitory because they, they bind to proteins or receptors, what we call GABA receptors and glycinergic receptors. And those, when they are activated, they cause neurons to hyperpolarize or deactivate for you know, people who really are not familiar with this. And glutamate is the primary excitatory signal within the brain and the retina. And what they do is they bind to a different, uh, different channels. And what they do is those channels, when they're activated, they cause the cell to depolarize, which means that you're activating these cells. And so it's a combination of you know, excitatory and inhibitory signals that will shape the response of retinal ganglion cells. All right, so then we have the uh, dopaminergic uh, amacrine cells, right? Mm -hmm. So how are they different from the GABAergic and uh, glycinergic amacrine cells? So some cells are both glycinergic or GABAergic and at the same time dopaminergic. So like I said, some cell, a lot of amacrine cells tend to also come with an extra flavor of something else. Like I said, so you, know, you might look at a glycinergic cell, but this guy is also releasing substance P. Or this, I uh, glyc this amacrine cell, like say the starburst, is acetylcholine, you know, releasing acetylcholine, but it's also gabaergic. So, you know, there is some sometimes an extra flavor to that. But, you know, dopamine is very complex because, you know, depends on there are two different really types of dopamine receptors, like the D1 receptor and the D2 receptor. And depending on like, you know, these receptors typically are coupled with different other proteins within the cell. And this, depending on who they couple to, typically it's some sort of G protein, it can cause some, it could cause excitatory or inhibitory sort of mechanisms to occur. And also, you know, it, it's very dependent on, you know, a lot of other things such as like the age of the retina or, or the different light signals involved. Interesting. So if I was to guess from what you're mm -hmm. saying, so, we we name an amacrine cells um, its neurotransmitter depending on how much it secretes. So if it's more uh, dopamine, then we would we consider it dopaminergic? Or again, it's is that nonsense? Um, well, uh, not necessarily. You know, for many people, we just call them amacrine cells because you know when people describe, oh, we found like say. This amacrine cell is both dopaminergic but also glycinergic. So, so, but you know, rarely do you have a lot of cells that express two different neurotransmitters. Typically, most neurons, especially in the brain, try to express one type of neurotransmitter. So, like say in the basal ganglia, for example, there are like cells that almost purely, you know, secrete dopaminergic. So we call these dopaminergic, you know, neurons. Now, for the you know, retina, it's much more complicated because American cells are a little bit more complicated because they sometimes, you know, not only they, you know, this, like I said, secrete glycine, but they also might secrete non-neurotransmitters because not everything secreted by an American cell will be necessary a neurotransmitter. Like things like substance P or NNOS might not necessarily sort of fit into that same category. But, you know, and generally, when we think of American cells, we just broadly call them, you know, Based, well, based on if they're glycinergic or gabaergic. Sounds good. So I feel I'd be uh, remiss if I don't talk about uh, vitreous, right? <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So um, for people who don't know, the vitreous is this um, viscous, you know, jelly sort of, you know, genetic material that actually gives the eyeball its uh, rigidity, right? And it, you know, feeds nutrients to the lens and it protects the retina in a way. But the reason why we're both laughing about mm -hmm. vitreous is because it's the bane of my existence in the lab, right? So for us to actually do experiments on the retina, we need to, first we, you know, we prepare the model, we take out the eyes, then, you know, we basically dissect the, the eyeball. And um, then we have to clean this vitreous substance, right? And for me, it's, it's been <laughs> hell, and I'm still trying to figure it out. But um, yeah, can you 
tell us why we actually need to clean this vitreous from the retina before we could actually use it to do our experiments because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm totally sick of this thing. So for those, you know, for you, Idris, you know, the reason why vitreous removal is very important is that, you know, for example, during two, I mean, it's not as important, like say during two photon recording because, you know, but for, for patch clamp, it's much more important because so people who people who don't know what patch clamp is essentially is that patch clamp involves trying to take a glass needle and try to stick it to the surface of a retinal ganglion cell surface. Okay. But you can't really do that if you know, it's being clogged up by vitreous. And so for many people like me, we have to remove the vitreous using essentially forceps, like these tiny little forceps to rip away the retina from the vitreous. Otherwise, if we don't do that, it'll just clog up our pipette tips and we can't, you know, record electrical activity from our retinal ganglion cells. And so that is the reason why we do it. But on the other hand, we do it because if we don't remove vitreous, it's a lot harder to flatten the retina because what we do is that we actually flatten a piece of the retina on a little glass cover slip. And if there's a lot of vitreous, you know, the retina tends to curl up it. And then and when we're trying to, you know, put in it some sort of a solution, it will just fly away and tissue is gone. And so that's why, but if there's no retina, I mean, if there's no vitreous, it's much easier to flatten it and it'll stick much more better on the cover slip and, you know, and we'll have a great day. But otherwise, you know, there, there are very good reasons to remove the vitreous and that's something Idris should continue to practice and, you know, master very quickly. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. All right. So now I'm down to what, like 35 minutes. Hey, that's too slow. That's, that's too, too slow. slow. <laughs> that's too slow. Still. Hey, hey. Back in the days, I used to do one for probably an hour and a half. So that's yeah. I mean, progress, that's in, that's in, that's it is progress, but not fast enough. So. <laughs> uh, all right. Interesting. Because okay. the the faster you are, the better your tissue is going to be. That's true. That's true. So yeah, we're, we're always at a, you know, race for time, right? When it comes to transferring our, our uh, retina from our, um, from the microscope to, you know, our, our devices to actually do our experiments on it. Right. Yeah, typically. So for mice retina, what we find is that once we dissect, you know, the retina, they typically last for like about eight hours before they start, you know, start going kaput. So yeah. And so there is there is some sort of you know time restriction placed on us. All right. So that's good. That's good. Um. So I'd want us to segue into something more general when it comes to mm -hmm. science, uh, Andrew. So you've done a lot of bench work, meaning you've been in a in the lab for countless number of hours, right? And uh, you're a very hardworking guy. I'm not trying to you know like you know inflate your head or anything, <laughs> mm -hmm. but even amongst the very hardworking kids at Feinberg, you actually kind of stand out. So you go to the lab on Saturdays, Sundays, like you sometimes sleep in the lab. I don't know well, how healthy that is for your sanity, but you still do it anyways. And I commend you for that. <laughs> so, you know, a yeah. lot of people will have different governing philosophies when it comes to work ethic. So for me, you know, I feel more comfortable when I'm productive and, and considering, you know, our lab is relatively small, you know, so, and there's not a lot of manpower. So, you know, I have to sort of fill in a lot of the gaps there. So that's, you know, one reason there and two reasons actually, but for other people, you know, some people, and I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing it or not ridiculing it, but some people need, you know, to take off Saturdays and Sundays, you know, stick to an eight hour regimen. And, it's, it's perfectly fine as long as you're productive because, you know, some days, you know, you'll have crunch time, especially, you know, when there's a grant to or, or if there's a publication that you want to, you know, rush out quickly. And so you'll see a lot of people do crunch hours that come on the weekends. But, you know, there are a lot of successful ways to do science. You know, mine just happens to be one of them, but everyone, you know, can reach their own ways. Okay, so you did mention grants and writing papers. That's actually where I was going at with this. So you've written a few papers in your time. So if I was to say the dynamic of traversing science itself is a skill, right? So uh, your lab has, you know, a certain domain 
knowledge it's trying to seek and understand. So, I mean, and it all costs money, right? Science is expensive. It costs money. So you have to write papers. You have to, you know, write proposal. You have, you have to get grants. Now, for people who aren't necessarily scientists or not in this field, um, this process might seem like a black box and it's, you know, it tends to get ripe for, um, for conspiracy theories, if, if you know mm. what I mean, right? So, so for the uninitiated, can you please uh, describe, you know, the paper writing process, you know, the grant proposal writing process and even getting grants itself. I know this is a very broad. Oh yeah. It's uh, very broad and broad controversial area. still. Very yeah. controversial. Right. But just for people who aren't in this field. Right. So if you can just give them a description of the process, so they know from someone who actually has done it several times. So it's, there are the general principle is so um, you write your paper right there's going to be introduction there's going to be a methodology section there will be a results section a bibliography and a discussion section so, so there's real, quick, real quick do you mm -hmm. do you write the paper after you've gotten a grant or you write the paper then seek a grant it depends on your strategy so for some people they typically publish a paper so that they can leverage, so they have some leverage when it comes to getting a grant, okay? Now, but if you're like, you know, a new professor, right? You know, if you just barely get started, typically you'll try to, you know, get a grant first, you know, and it's, pre you know, it's filled with preliminary data, and then you'll try to promise them, I will publish a paper using this grant money, et cetera. So there are different ways that people are going through this. So, but anyway, so when you're writing paper, you, like I said, you have those five sections, right? You know, you have your figures, you know, you're editing, you make sure everything's perfect. And so what you typically do is, you know, you try to gauge and like, okay, where, which journal do I want to send this in? Do I want to send this into the most prestigious journal possible? Or do I want to send this into like, you know, a medium journal or, or some sort of low rank journal, okay? And so, you know, the, for every scientist, the wildest dream is to publish in some high ranking journal, one with a giant impact factor, because all journals, even subcategories like say nature medicine or nature neuroscience, they will have impact scores. And this is like a number assigned to like 16, nine or et cetera. So for example, like nature or science, they have an impact factor of 30 or 40, whereas J neuroscience has like something like seven point, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. PNAS nine point something, something, something. Uh, nature neuroscience like 11 point something 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 like that so and the higher the number the better obviously but you have to gauge on the paper's content whether you know this is something for nature because nature is like the, something broad something huge something that will break the paradigm right and is your paper like that maybe not maybe so Otherwise, you can always publish in like other really good journals, like Neuron. These are still, you know, pretty high tier papers, very respectable. Even J Neuroscience, even though it's like impact factors like seven point, et cetera, et cetera, is a very respected journal nonetheless. And so you you sort of so what the professor does typically is you submit the journal, you you submit the manuscript of your publication to the editor of the journal. Usually the you know, the journal website will say, oh, submit your paper here. And you usually use a cover like say, dear editor, doctor, blah, 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 blah. You know, here's our manuscript. I hope you find it interesting. Please send it to peer review, okay? You know, if you have conflicts of interest that you think might happen, you say, please exclude X, Y, and Z, okay? And so the editor will get your manuscript, right? And he or she will sort of look at it and say, is this sort of the right fit for us? You know, is this where, you know, the gen sort of like the general vibe of where we're going, okay? If the editor sort of thinks so, they might, they will send it for peer review, okay? So peer review is scientists of your peer, so people within the same field as you, you know, people you, who you probably will know, you know, probably your colleagues, your competitors sometimes, well, get your manuscript, they will look over it and they will critique it, okay? And they think, okay, this paper ha is a great paper. I think, it's gr I think it should be published, but I have a few criticisms I would like you to address, right? I think you should do this experiment or you didn't cite this paper or some, you know, and typically there are like three or a couple reviewers 
per your paper. And each of them will be anonymous and have well, different opinions on that paper. And the editor's job is sort of to gather all those criticisms and all of the, the sort of, you know, what they think of the paper and sort of tell you, like, okay, based on their comments, they think your paper has a shot of being published in my journal, in this journal, okay? However, there are some common criticisms, like such as you need to do this control experiment or this figure looks shitty or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you will try, you have the decision to either, you know, try to, address those criticisms such as do the actual experiment they recommend or if you think it's unfair it's like okay we think it's unfair to do this 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 and this okay because we have this this and this and this so you try to do your best to be diplomatic as possible so you will do the experiments you might you know do some sentence changing like add a citation that they ask you to do okay which might be the self-serving on part of the uh reviewer but anyways um, and then you'll send it back to them. And then editor said, okay, you know, Professor Samola has made these changes, okay. okay let's, and then the same people or sometimes the different people will look at the paper, okay. Okay, Dr. Samola has done the changes. We like the changes. We don't think there's nothing else to change. Publish, okay. And they said, oh, okay. Editor says, we will publish your paper. Now, there is a publishing fee. Typically, it's a couple hundred dollars, but if you're like in Nature Neuro or Nature, they might run into a thousand dollar kind of range. So, <laughs> and after that's done, your paper's published. Interesting. So now let's talk about the grant um, proposal mm -hmm. process. So you've got this, uh, you know, ingenious idea, and you you're looking to get funding for it, right? So. It, for our lab, we mostly get our funding from the NIH, right? Most biological laboratories typically get their funding from the NIH, okay. the NSF. However, there are a lot of different, different types of funding sources, such as the DOD, apparently the military or the Department of Defense also has a budget for scientific funding. And, you know, some of these might be like military applications, like making better missiles or or some of them are more electronics or others are medical, you know, in nature. For example, my old lab, we applied for a DOD grant one. So, so there are a lot of different, you know, federal sourced funding, but there are also a lot of private fundings, you know, foundations, you know, run by philanthropists or other organizations seeking, saying they have a very specific mission. Like we want to support young scientists with great ideas. So if you are fit a very narrow category, we will fund you if you apply, okay? Mm -hmm. Or we're seeking people who are doing diabetic research or retinal diab, you know, retinal di you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different, you know, sort of, you know, agencies out there with different missions. All right. So and, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I'm I'm happy you actually mentioned um, private philanthropists, right? So so let's say Bill Gates wanted to you know fund your next vaccine for maybe you know COVID for uh, SARS CoV two, uh, right? So mm -hmm. how would that go about? You know, would would he um, be breathing down your neck to you know maybe put something in it, maybe to chip uh, the c citizens of America? So typically, a lot of foundations do not breathe down your neck. They, it's considered not professional, and seldom, there are some seldom cases in which you know, private in, philanthropists or investors try to you know, get scientists to you know, publish their conclusion at a very certain angle that might benefit them, such as you know, several industries owned by the Soto, you know, several you know, foundations uh, founded by the soda industries, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But, you know, it's typically, you know, these foundations try not to, you know, you know, put you in these kind of positions. So, but you also have to be worried that, you know, this is sort of, you know, research that you're expected to do anyway. So, so if Bill Gates tries to do that, that's, it's very controversial and that would be very controversial if he tried to, you know, force you, to produce a position that you might not necessarily agree with. So for example, there was a so-called Stanford study it was founded apparently by the founder of JetBlue who tried, who communicated with scientists to, you know, publish results that, you know, some of the, some of the original authors 
disagreed heavily and did not want any part of this, so they removed themselves from the paper, which was published in a, not in even a journal, but some sort of like, free, you know, some sort of upper, I can't remember. Interesting. And so those, so you, you know, it's when you, when it comes to private funding, you have to, you know, one, disclose your, you know, disclose that you got private funding because typically in any publication or grant funding, you disclose where you got your money. And that's, you know, that's the most ethical thing to do. So for example, like whenever we publish some things like this work was funded by the NIH or R01 dash yada, 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 number, 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 or it, this, you know, publication was funded using money from the Koch foundation or whatever, et cetera, et cetera, or you get the idea. Okay. So if, this, if you don't disclose those, you know, funding sources, you're in deep shit. Interesting. All right. Perfect. So, um, Andrew, I'd say uh, we've touched on uh, a lot of um, points tonight. And mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to touch on? Or I mean, uh, I mean, I will touch on anything that you want to touch on. So I'd say we've uh, exhausted uh, our time a bit. <laughs> But uh, I really do appreciate you doing this. Uh, it, it did take me a while to get you, even though we, we share the same lab, it did take me a while to, you know, mm -hmm. set this up. Now I'm if, a busy man, so yes, <laughs> I'm a very busy man. You are, you are. I can attest to that. So if anyone wants to get a hold of you, um, if they want to read your papers, if they want to, you know, if they are interested in what you're doing, how, do, how can they get in contact with you, Andrew? Well, the best way is to email me. So you should find my name on the new website. So there's a tab and in that tab, there's called a little link called current students. And from there you can find my name. So my, so a lot of labs have websites. Apparently mine does not. So, <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not a very vocal kind of group, but not at all. No. Yeah. But if you are interested, um, you could sort of email me from that link and I will try to address any questions that you have down there. Perfect. Well, on that note, Andrew, thank you. And, uh, you have a good one now. You too. Thank you, Idris. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. This was great.